Well, we made it to Friday. And you know what? Because you made it to Friday, we want to treat you to a special interview that we had with Astros legend Terry Poole. I can't wait to talk to him and hear what he has to say about the Astros then and now. Eric, hit the intro music. Locked on Astros, your daily Astros podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric the Man Heisman and Greg H-Town Wheelhouse Chansey. We are Locked on Houston Astros and we hope that you join us for a daily Locked on Astros podcast. My name is Eric Heisman. You can find me on X at Eric Talks Astros. Find the show at Locked on Astros, your team every day. Brett, where can I find you at? They can find me at H Town Wheelhouse on X, Instagram, and TikTok. They can find me at Stros411 on X, Instagram, and Facebook. Always positive. Positive I love when the Astros legend joins the show. Always Stros. And that is uh, Mr. TP down there. That is Terry Poole. Uh, he's a former Astros player, played with the Houston Astros for 14 years. Uh, go and uh, say hi and uh, tell us where they can uh, tell people where they can reach you at. Hi. I'm, yeah. Terry Poole, who uh, loves the Astros, not just played for them, but loves the Astros. And uh, you know, I currently uh, am uh, I'm at Corda Management Group. Uh, we're a wealth management group here in Houston. Um, visit us, 8955 Katy Freeway. You know, and uh, we do good work and uh, would love to uh, talk to people. All right, guys, uh, join, thank you for visiting us as well, for making us your first listen every day. Um, go and subscribe to us on YouTube. Go and make us your first listen on Apple, Odyssey, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Go and check out the Locked on Astros podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers, join today and get $100, $150 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, get, visit FanDuel dot com slash locked on to get started today so uh brett i know that um a lot of um of our um longtime listeners they're going to know who terry uh, pull uh is some of the um the um, i don't want to call them bandwagon fans but some of the newer astros fans <laughs> since 2017 uh they may not be as familiar so part of what we like to do on this podcast is uh bring back some of the older players that um some of the legends of the game and to um to some of the current day fans and so that is you uh tp and we wanted to just kind of get a little background of who you are and um how did you end up playing for the houston astros because correct me if i'm wrong you did not get drafted, right? Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> and the reason I didn't get drafted is because they did not have the draft in Canada in that year. I think it was several years later that they actually started it. So I signed a free agent uh, contract in 73. I went to my first spring training in 74 and uh, ended up uh, playing three and a half years in the minor leagues, made stops at every location, rookie league, A-ball, double-A, triple-A, played for some wonderful managers, got called up. Uh, right after my uh, 21st birthday and uh, so <laughs> with, the, with the Dodgers in town after the All-Star break, uh, my first game I ever played was against uh, with uh, 44,000 people and I never wow. played a game in front of 4,000 people before that. So that was, you know, it, it was fast and furious. <laughs> hey, Brett, uh, I have a follow-up question at uh, TP. Um, what did they? What do teams do back then for Canadian uh, players like yourself? Do they okay. wine and dine you, or do they, uh, <laughs> visit, they go up to visit you? I'm just curious. I mean, uh, this is like a, a team from Texas to get somebody from uh, Canada. I I was playing in a Canadian national tournament, and okay. our team won. I was a pitcher, infielder. Never played a game in the outfield. In the scout Wayne Morgan for the Astros at that time. Uh, it came up to me after he said, are you interested in a pro contract? <laughs> I looked at him and said, are you crazy? Of course I am. It was a, so he said he'd, he'd come visit me in my hometown uh, two weeks later. He did. He was to the day, two weeks. Uh, I was actually starting the 12th grade and uh, came back after school. He's sitting in my kitchen with my mom and dad. And uh, he says, uh, uh, I'm just going to take him out, uh, hit a few balls, make sure his arm is right, run him a little bit came back he says okay well, i want to offer you a contract and we sat down and uh, 
um, because I was 17 years old, I had to have both parents sign off also. And uh, my dad signed it, uh, and my mom refused to sign it. So she and she walks out of the room, <laughs> and I slid over into her chair and signed her name, and off we went to. You know. <laughs> so, well, I love it. Oh man, don't, yeah, don't do this. <laughs> the insider track, yes. Uh, yeah, Terry, that that's a great story. Now, when you look at contracts today, it was a little bit different in size. I mean. You, when I talk to players that played in your era or even before, even even a little after, when I talk to like Clay Hensley, he's like, man, I wish I got compensated like these guys. Even Mike Stanton, he's like, these guys get compensated. Wow, it's it's it is it is insane the amount of money that pours in. But really, at the time when you're young, you're not thinking about the money. You're thinking about I want to go live out my dreams and I want to go play baseball and. You don't, there aren't a ton of Canadian born players, but it seems like the ones that have come from Canada have been very good for the most part. And so that's pretty neat. I know in the 70, because you came up in 77, um, you had 229 at bats, but the next three years, 78, 79, and 80, seemed to be like you had quite a run 169 hits, 172 hits, 151 hits. Um, those teams you were on and that 1980s Astros team, tell us about being a part of that squad because there were some special players. J.R. Richard, I, if if I'm correct, um, Larry Durker was on those teams. Jo, was um, Joe Morgan with y'all at that time? Well, actually, uh, uh, Larry Durker, his last season was 77, I believe. Well, it was 77. Okay, okay. I didn't know if he carried over into those into those years. Oh, but. It, it, yeah, into 77, 78, 79. It was kind of the, uh, we just started winning. And then 1980, of course, we beat the Dodgers in that extra game at Dodger Stadium where Joe Necro uh, ended up pitching that extra ball game. And then we went to the playoffs with the Phillies. But uh, uh, J.R. Richard also had the stroke in 1980. Uh, right. So we, uh, and that's when Vern Rule stepped in and mm. had, such a wonderful you know, uh, career year for us. So, uh, but uh, Joe Morgan came back to the Astros in 1980. And so I played with Joe for one year. And I, I learned more about hitting from Joe Morgan in that one year, just during batting practice. He used to always say to me, he said, Terry, if you hit a, because we were both left-handed hitters. He said, you hit a ball down the right field line. And if you can hold it, to hold it straight, you know, which means it doesn't hook foul or whatever. Uh, he says, you know how to hit. And I said, well, yeah, I can do that. But what am I doing to, to do that? And uh, and he says, well, you got to hit the inside half of the ball. And so mm. I learned little things from from Joe that uh, – <laughs> so you know, I only got to play one year with uh, Joe Morgan, but uh, and he had his greatest years, of course, in Cincinnati. So let me ask you real quick, just a quick follow up about that 1980 series, Eric, and then um, I'll move to you. The 1980 series is really considered to this day one of the best, if not the best playoff series of all time. Yeah. What was it like being in that series? And I mean, was it just, I mean, emotion and adrenaline each game? Because it seemed like really the whole way it was, it was either teams to take you, you guys are the Phillies and, I mean, you guys were so close to being the first Astros team to be in a World Series. Kind of, kind of go back over that series and the emotion involved. You know, and, and stepping back from that, you know, uh, when Tal Smith and I were uh, inducted into the Astros Hall of Fame uh, two years ago in '22, the, uh, the the memory that Tal Smith has to date is scary. I mean, this guy knew more about that series than I could remember. Wow. But uh, so it was uh, okay. It was a five-game series at that time uh, with the Phillies. All five games were uh, well. Four of them were uh, in extra innings, and one was decided in the ninth. And uh, so it, it was, you know, it, in my opinion, that was the greatest series <laughs> that that I've ever participated in. And I played in the '86 series too. So and that oh, was that's right. And the, the Mets call it their greatest series ever, you know? So, um, anyways, uh, you know, getting back to that, um, the, the Philadelphia, we, 
we ended up playing that extra game at Dodger Stadium. Uh, and then we had a tremendous giant party <laughs> and, and it continued on the plane over to Philadelphia. And then we suited up to play the next night against Philadelphia. And uh, I did not play in game one. I played in games two, three, four, and five and um, got to face Steve Carlton. I think it was uh, in game four again, but uh, it was, it'll go down as it was, in my memory, as the greatest time in in, in my career. That's wow. the breeze. Yeah, thanks for telling us that, uh, TP. So in a second, um, I'm going to rewind a little bit and go back to your rookie season and ask you a couple of questions about that. All right, everybody, this episode is brought to you by Backblaze. Backblaze is something that I've got to tell you about. You, If you need unlimited cloud backup for your Mac or PCs or business and you want it for an affordable price, you need to check these guys out. $99 a year. I mean, need I say more? I mean, I could stop there and you probably are going to go get it, but you don't know where to get it or what the discount code is. So let me give you a couple details. Um, you can access your backup your backup data from anywhere in the world using their web app or on you, whether you're on Android or iOS. Over 55 billion files have been restored as a result of Backblaze, and you can get a fully featured, no risk free trial at backblaze.com/slash locked on MLB. Unlimited backup space for ninety nine dollars a year. I mean, you cannot beat that. It is a no risk free trial and you can seriously back up your stuff. It will give you time to do that. A simple deployment across multiple workstations, multiple restore options in the event of data loss or ransomware, back up all the data on multiple machines. Look, just go to backblaze.com slash locked on MLB, sign up for a free trial and see why Backblaze is recommended by Inc. Magazine. Go to backblaze.com slash locked on MLB today. Hey guys, thank you for making Locked On Astros podcast your first listen every day. Whether it's on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to us. Go ahead and make us your first listen on Apple, Odyssey, Spotify. Wherever you listen to your podcast, go and check out the Locked On Astros podcast. But go and check out Locked On Sports today. It's the first ever 24-7 streaming channel that has all the sports news you need today. With uh, The Chiefs did win the Super Bowl, but unfortunately there were some incidents afterwards that uh, was a little bit more heartening. But, unfor- uh, but there is news for you out there 24 7 so go check out locked on sports today and once the season gets started the astros start winning you know brett and i will be on there as well all right so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at your rookie season um you got called up for 60 games and i know that in today's world um with with uh, social media there may have been a lot of well he didn't hit any home runs that uh-huh. season uh but you hit 301 that right. year and you you played uh, um at the astrodome and that was not a homer field what was it like when you first got i know it was a, a little while ago but what was it like when you first got called up and what was your major takeaways from your uh, first season yeah that's uh you bring up a really good point because when I first got to the Astros, uh, there was a, a a great player on the Astros, Bob Watson. Mm-hmm. And Bob, Bob walks over to me and he says, Terry, let me give you a little bit of advice. And he was, a, you would consider him probably the, the best home run hitter on the Astros at that time. And he said to me, he says, Terry, if you, if you don't, if you keep the ball in the air at the Astrodome, you'll have a very short career. <laughs> he says, so you want to hit the ball on the line or on the ground in the dome? He says, that's what I try to do. And he says, I got a lot more power than you. And he's, and so the style of hitting was different at that time than nowadays. You know, plus you got athletes that are, are bigger and stronger today. But uh, we did not elevate the ball. We actually got down through the ball, you know, to try to make put backspin on the ball to make it, you know, you know his line drives. So No, and you know, that – that really touches on a strategy that even Chipper Jones employed. And they asked Chipper Jones. I remember um, Harold Reynolds was going over um, Chipper Jones swing and, 
And he goes, how did you hit so many home runs? And he said, my goal was to knock a hole in the middle of the center field fence, <laughs> not hit it over, but knock a hole. Mark McGuire was asked the, one of the great home run hitters of my time growing up. And he said, I just swing the bat and try to put the bat on the ball. And if my barrel hits the ball, more than likely it's going to go out of the park. He goes, I never try to hit home runs. Hitting a home run is the hardest thing to do. So I just swing. And so many players, even down to Josh Rojas, told me a story uh, um, with with Josh Reddick, and I got to re- retell us to Reddick. He hadn't heard it, and he was trying to pull the ball down in Corpus. And Reddick's like, "What are you doing? This is a ballpark that's got a lot of wind. Just hit, hit to the opposite field." And his average jumped 60 to 80 points that season. So you got 1,361 hits. That's a lot of hits, and the way baseball is played today it's all about launch angle it's all about exit velo and all the you know all the all the x stats and the expected batting average and all that stuff woba and all these how did you just did you just take the advice from the guys as you went through the major leagues because i mean you just mentioned it you're on two legendary teams 80 and 86 you guys are so close to get to the world series but 1300 hits to sustain that takes a lot of work were you constantly retooling your swing or did you just stick with what worked and that's what helped you get to that point uh, uh c- coming into the astros early on i was really a front foot hitter and uh, and so i had to, you know, I, was, I, I hit off the fastball and i was a table setter i was the leadoff hitter you know bill verdon had me there because i could run i could score i, I remember scoring from first base i was stealing one time and Enos Cabell was up, and he he hit a single. All he got was a single, and I scored on the play. Wow. So I could run, and uh, so <laughs> and so I had to use my strengths, and that's what uh, you know. With Bill Verdon, if as an outfielder, if you didn't hit the cutoff, man, you, you know he'd let you have it when you came into the dugout, and if you did it a second time, you wouldn't see the field. Wow. And, that's just the way this guy operated, and uh, you had to respect that and play that style of the game. So, so, so those first few years, you know, uh, I was a table setter, so I could hit off the fastball a little bit more. And then, you know, they started throwing me, you know, you know a few more changeups and curveballs, and you know, so I actually changed my swing with uh, Dennis Menke uh, later on okay. in the uh, mid '80s. And I became a, a back foot hitter, which made I, I tried to stay back because that's the only way you can hit a changeup or a breaking ball. If you're lunging out front and they throw you a changeup, or you just you're you're not going to be a, a major league hitter, and you'll I'll be back in Saskatchewan before you know it. So uh, <laughs> uh, you have to you you have to know your strengths. You know, I knew I was a fastball hitter. Why would I go up and face a Dwight Gooden who had the best breaking ball in the world? You could hear it. You would, throw, it would you'd get her, it would be coming, wow. and you knew with two strikes they'd all stand up at Shea Stadium. Well, what do you think you're going to get? You're going to get that breaking ball, and so why would I look for that early in the count? If I face him, Dwight Gooden, I'm going to look for a fastball, and if he's anywhere around the plate, I'm going to put my barrel of the bat on that ball. So you got to be a little bit. You know, some guys are just great, great hitters. You know, the Barry Bonds of the world, uh, the Tony Gwynns and everything. These guys were exceptional hitters. Uh, so I would had to stay with what worked for me and not try to do, you know, other things. You know, I talked to uh, hitting with Jeff Bagwell a little bit. You know, Jeff is an RBI guy. I was a table player. You know, I, I set the table. And so, you know, we hit different ways. You know, uh, okay. he would say he would literally look for location and not so much what the pitch was. He would look for a location if the ball was in the location swing at. Well, that, that that was completely not the way I hit. And so if two guys had hit completely different, but you know, Jeff's job, you know, an RBI guy was, you know, completely different than what I what I was uh, trained to do. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that your strength was getting on base and stealing bases, and but I want to say that in 1980 season, maybe the reason they were so good was because you had 13 home runs as well. But oh. in a second, um, I, I do want to ask you um, about the enlarged, the larger bases and all the different uh, rule changes they have in today's game. What would that have done to you? So uh, start thinking about uh, that answer, uh, and uh, we'll be back in a second. 
Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel is America's number one sports book because right now we want you to get into the action. We want you to get buckets and get buckets and make buckets. Look, the Houston Rockets are way better than they have been the last couple of years, and you can still bet with them. Even though they're not in the play-in game yet, maybe they'll get there. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your bet wins. So you need to go there today. Why? Because you can bet on all your favorite NBA teams and players like Alperin Shingoon, Cam Whitmore, who is an absolute bucket, and so many more options. Jokic, you've got Giannis. I mean, the sky's the limit. You got LeBron going to his 20th straight NBA All Star game. Insane. You got quick bets, same game parlays, exclusive props, and so much more. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right. So um, to go back to the question I asked, Terry, I know that uh, back in the 80s and 70s and um, back then, speed was a big part of the game. I, I remember Ricky Henderson, he would have a lot of uh, steals. But um, I wanted to kind of uh, get your opinion on the new rules. I know that there are larger bases and the pitchers can throw over to the bases uh, fewer times during the game. They're trying to get more speed back in the game. Uh, how would that have affect the new rules affected you back then? And what do you think about the, the game as it is right now? Well, I think the, the, the larger bases uh, would, have, would have helped my style because, I mean, I'm two inches closer to him uh, running down first. You know, how, how many bang, bang plays at home uh, from home to first that were, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. So some, most of them that were bang, bang would have went my way. Uh, so uh, more infield hits. Ray Knight, it wouldn't have made a bit of a difference because he never got an infield hit in his life. You know, he hit 300 for us, but the guy couldn't run. So, but with me, and now now I'm on first base. Now again, it's a it's a, you know the, with the large bases, you know it's a shorter uh, expanse between first and second. So stealing bases, you know, again, the bang, bang plays, you know, the Jaegers throwing, the Johnny Bench is throwing, you know, it gives the, the base runner a little bit more. And now with the third thing you talked about was the, you know, you throw over twice and the third time if you throw over, you better pick him off or else he gets to go, you know, down to second base for your charge. And, uh, well, I mean, if, if he's already thrown over twice, to first base, and I, I can tell you a lot of times where people would keep on throwing over, and you know, you, right. you get exhausted over there, you know, because <laughs> you know, uh, and so, anyways, uh, uh, if somebody had thrown over two bases, I guarantee you, I, w- I would probably appear to do a shorter lead, you know, and and then on his first movement, I would. I would take off. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, I don't care what he did. I would just guess that on this, but I would make it appear to him. I had a shorter lead, but on his first movement, what, whatever it may be, you know, whether the bill, the cap or, you know, the, the hands coming up or what, whatever it is, um, you know, I would be moving on that uh, for, and that'd be a huge advantage for a base runner. Oh yeah, definitely. And, um, we have a thing, the uh, Savannah Bananas coming to town. They have their own banana ball league. And I think some people are thinking that uh, Manfred's turned uh, baseball into almost banana ball because there's some weird rules, ghost runner rules. A lot of things that I think someone like myself, a baseball purist, really, I don't I don't like the change of the game in a lot of areas because I understand what they're doing and why they're trying to shorten the game. But I don't know. I didn't hear a single person tell me that they started going to Astros games because they heard they were shorter. But I digress. Um, I could go on about that. Um, But real quick, I want to ask you before I get into some of your college coaching experience, because I know you did that for a long time. Is there anything you can share with us about Nolan Ryan? Because Nolan Ryan is so intriguing to me. When we interviewed his grandson, Jackson, um, when the movie came out. I asked Jackson, what is Nolan's favorite moment in baseball? And he literally said, I don't know. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, my grandfather never talked about baseball. Like he came home and it was all about us and he never talked about it. I was like, that's an amazing compartmentalization for one of the greatest pitchers. I know he was a heck of a guy, Texas dude, real hard nose. 
Do you have any anything fun or interesting you can share? Maybe that you had an interaction with Nolan or something during a game that might be interesting yeah, that we wouldn't know. Two quick stories for you. The first one uh, is uh, pretty current because you had uh, Lenny Dykstra had a just had a stroke the other day. Oh so man, Lenny Dykstra is with the Philadelphia Phillies. He's in. He's uh, where he's hitting. We're in the uh, Astrodome. Nolan is the pitcher the next day, so he's standing in the dugout between Craig Reynolds and I. And uh, Lenny Dykstra hits, I think it was his fifth home run of the year. It was before he hit you know, many home runs, but uh, at that time of his career, that was his fifth home run of the year. And he stands at home plate and watches it go out oh, and then jogs around the bases. And Nolan looks at Craig and I and he says, he says, fellas, he says, I think I've seen enough for today. And he walks out and you know, he, the next day he's the starting pitcher, you know, he's a starting pitcher. And who's the leadoff batter? Lenny <laughs> Lenny walks up there, first pitch of the game, right in the ribs. Wow. He goes down and he jumps up, you know, Lenny jumps up like he's gonna, you know, run at Nolan and Nolan is staring at him. And well, I think Lenny figured it out what what he had done, and he nodded at Nolan, and Nolan nodded at him, and the game went on. <laughs> wow, game recognized game is what kids would call that today. I, I love that story. Thank you. For I guess that. Robin Ventura didn't uh, learn his lesson. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, but about Nolan Ryan was uh, Craig Reynolds and I were. This is a spring training. You know, our wives leave. You know, with a week left in spring training, they all come back to use. And so the guys go out to eat together after. It was at uh, Kissimmee at the Kissimmee Steakhouse. Okay. We're meeting Nolan Ryan at the Kissimmee Steakhouse, and so Craig and I are driving over there together. And we thought, well, geez, we're a little bit early. We'll stop by Nolan's house and and see. You know, we'll just pick him up and take him. So we go there. We knock on his front door. There's you know no answer, and I jiggle the door it's locked so we walk around the back we, we can see his car is there and you know he we know he's meeting us in like about five ten minutes so we walk around the back door and knock again no answer i open the door it's open we walk in and we can hear the shower going and we go oh my goodness he's taking a shower. Yeah, of course he's in there and he had his tv on so craig and i walk into the place and we said, well, he's got to come out of that room. He'll turn the TV off before he leaves. Let's hide behind the stairwell here. And when he comes out, we're going to both jump up and scream. Don't turn the TV off once he does. So sure enough, you know, we're there. And then we're thinking, you know, the, the shower goes off. Now he's got me. He's getting ready to come. We're thinking, this is stupid, you know, because, you know, no one knows how to handle guns, and you know. <laughs> and, but now we're we're kind of locked in. We got to, you know, we're waiting on him. Sure enough, he comes out of there. He hits that TV. Craig and I jump up and scream as loud as we can. Don't turn the TV off. While well, he went right through the roof, and <laughs> so I always tell people that you know he throws a hundred mile an hour fastball with a ninety mile an hour curveball, but he says, you know what, he scares just like you and I do. <laughs> I love that, man. Thank you for sharing that. It's a great story. That's yeah, phenomenal. Good, and a great teammate. Nolan is one of the fine gentlemen in the game, but he's uh, he's an icon. You know, uh, <laughs> I just you know, Nolan. I, I I I have on my phone the website that has the catch I made for his fifth no hitter. Wow. And so every time I see Nolan, I say, Nolan, come over here. I got something to show you. And he said, oh, he says, yeah, TP, I know what you got on your phone. And so I, I found that with the catch of Mike Sosha that, that saved his fifth no-hitter. And, yeah, he always comes over and he just shakes and says, okay, TP, show it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. I mean, you're part of um, Nolan Ryan's history. Also, you're part of a lot of kids. Uh, being a college coach, how did you get into that? And I hear that you uh, retired from that last year. Yes, I did. I was I'd, my first year was 2006. Uh, it was uh, it was <laughs> really uh, I don't know if you remember a guy named Carl Warwick. He used to be with the the Colt 45s. In fact, yeah, you know, he's got. Uh, but anyways, Carl was in Houston. I ended up uh, he 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 had somehow heard that I was interested in coaching possibly, and this job came open in Victoria. So he sends the athletic director into Houston. He meets me in my downtown office in the tunnel. And we start talking about, and you know, a week later, I'm signed 
to become the head, the first head coach of the University of Houston Victoria baseball program. And right. so, uh, you know, and, and so now I'm committed to, you know, of course, you know, full time to the program. And that same year, I get a phone call from uh, Team Canada, uh, um, Baseball Canada said, hey, Ernie Witt can't um, participate uh, in on the, the Team Canada because the we were going to the uh, the, the Olympics, you know, the and or at least qu- trying to qualify for the Olympics. And so they asked me, would I take the team uh, w- because uh, Ernie couldn't uh, be the manager of that team? I says, I says absolutely. So you know, so now I'm uh, I'm a, a, the t- the head coach of Team Canada and the University of Houston Victoria. So I'm in a predicament. I've got my team playing over there. And that was a time, if you remember, Phil Garner just got fired. Okay, by about a wow. month. Okay. I call up Gar and I say, Phil, you know, any chance you take my team down in Victoria for for I think it was three weeks while I went we went to uh, did a, a qualifying round in Cuba with Team Canada. Right. Yeah, he said that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> cool. He took the That's- team. Yeah, it was like uh, that March and. Uh, the, he he lost his game first game and then he won every game after that and then I came in and we we had a completely uh, um, uh, the the whole month of March we won every ball game that year too. wow so that was pretty cool of Phil to do that that's awesome sorry my dog kind of came in and uh, his his name is Milo he's named after legendary Milo Hamilton and I'm sitting here talking with the legend he's like hey there's an Astros legend on I guess that's why he wanted to come in here. <laughs> But, you know, thank you so much for, you know, for sharing with us. Um, we we definitely would love to have you back um, during the season um, because we would like to get your take on this team. I mean, the Astros are the favorites, um, again, in, in the American League. I mean, they're on a historic run. Um, they very well could go back to the World Series in 2024, and it just seems like it's never-ending. When we thought the era was over, now it's like they go out and get Josh Hader, um, I'm wondering if they're talking to guys like Montgomery and Snell. I mean, the longer these free agents wait, I think the the less likely it is they sign big deals. Maybe we get the Snellzilla on like a one year deal. But you know what I would love, and a friend of mine, Corbin, I'll give him credit for this. I would love for Jordan Montgomery to sign with the Astros and to get his ring from the Rangers in an Astros <laughs> uniform. That would be great. I'm happy for Bochi over there. You know, Bochi was no. a double A roommate. He's really, yeah, Bochy's uh, legendary. He, he's he's a great, great manager. That was a wonderful deal for them. All right, so uh, Brett, uh, go and tell us a little bit about this uh, card show that's coming up. Oh yeah, definitely. So um, so listen, Terry Poole and Phil Garner, who who he has mentioned, um, are going to be a part of something that is actually sponsored by U.S. Gold and Coin, and this is a great opportunity for you to meet astros legends and i want to share some details with you i'm I'm sitting here looking for my email where did it go um it is at us golden coin i know that it is um february 24th and um they are going to be there i i believe correct me if i'm wrong um it you you guys are going to sign autographs there correct um that's correct i'll be there from 9 to 11 in the morning bill is going to be there from 12 till 2 awesome and so what it is it is at u.s coin and jewelry um 8435 katie freeway houston texas 77024 um these astros greats are going to be there they are going to basically have complimentary coffee um and they're going to have an extensive sports memorabilia collection to show diverse inventory of rare coins and paper money um it'll feature exclusive discounts on new items and special giveaways Children under 18 will be complimentary. Um, curated starter packs to begin will um, will t- to begin their coin and sports card collections. Guests will have one-on-one time with these favorites uh, like Kenny Duncan Jr. and Matthew Duncan. And also, um, you, the team will open a sealed and certified hobby box of 1989 Upper Deck card packs in search of the King Griffey Jr. rookie card. Oh, wow. So Yeah, so make sure that you guys – tune in i actually have sent off one of my juniors to get graded and you know um 
Terry, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Pool. I know you said don't call you Mr. Pool, but TP, actually, TP, it is really cool to have you here because I do remember growing up in the Astrodome watching you guys play. Um, I remember how heartbroken I was, just like you guys in 86. And I know what the Mets have said. If you guys would have gone to game seven, there's no way they would have beat y'all because Mike Scott was on the mound and he was coming for their heads. And so thank you for sitting down with us and telling us these amazing stories. Um, really, I'm top notch. One of my favorite interviews to date. Um, I really, I really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you out there at the event. And if y'all are there, um, I will put up, I will make some, some kind of pamphlets or whatever I'll put online and you guys can know where to go. And um, locked on Astros will be there to help cover this event. Wonderful. I, I, in addition to all we said, I have become the executive uh, director of the Astro, well, the base, the Houston um, Club uh, Ast- uh, Alumni Association. We're, we're not using the Houston Astro name, but there, it's anybody who has ever played in the Houston Astro chain. So I, I'm making phone calls. I'm talking to guys like Doug Rader and that. And wow. I'll tell you, it is some of the funniest stuff I've ever <laughs> Doug Rader is a hoot. I mean, it's like, and I, you know, I got to see him when I, when I first went to spring training, I was at the you know, rookie camp and walked over there and watched him play, you know, so to be able to talk to him and, you know, uh, and talk to all these different players, it's just really incredible. Watch for our website. We'll be coming out with okay. our website pretty soon. We're on, yeah. we're on Instagram and we're on uh, Facebook too. Definitely. And I actually have a baseball card. You mentioned, um, Mr. Monike earlier. Um, um, Dennis, I believe he said, um, was your, was your coach, one of your coaches? Oh, Dennis Menke. Menke. Yes. I'm sorry. Menke. Yes. Oh. I actually have a Dennis Menke card from his, uh, playing years and my Astros binder. So that's, that's kind of cool that you mentioned. I'm like, Hey, I, I've got his card. I've had it for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I actually had uh tickets to Astros legends autograph session. So I actually met you in person one time. I'm sure you remember me with all the 50,000 <laughs> people that got autographs that day. So but yeah, we were both there, right? It was, it was, I think yeah. it was you, it was, it was back. Well, I mean, yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah. The- the Astros do a fun, a wonderful job at that fan fest, and uh, they, they, I, I look forward to it every year. You know, it's a, and you know, the the, uh, the faces change over there, right. and, and yeah. uh, but it's uh, the the Astros. You know, I like I said before, I wear this shirt with a lot of pride right here. Uh, there's no other team. I know I finished my career in Kansas City. I'm, you know, and I got to play with George Brett and Saber Hagen, those guys, and Kirk Gibson. You know, the crazy guys. I mean, it was just a wonderful experience. But my love is the Astros. Always will be. Yeah, we don't hold it against Akeem Olajuwon as well. And uh, <laughs> you, you don't all get to be like uh, Jose Altuve and hopefully get to finish the, his career with these yeah. Astros. But you yeah. did a majority of your career with the Astros, and we thank you for that, sir. We thank you for coming uh, on the Locked on Astros podcast. You are welcome anytime. This was great. And um, uh, we hope to see you around the ballpark, and hopefully you get to see another World Series. And so thank you for your time. And, guys, thank you for making Locked on Astros podcast your first listen every day. Go and subscribe to us. Go and make us your first listen on Apple, Odyssey, Spotify. Wherever you listen to your podcast, go and check out the Locked on Astros podcast. And for TP, for myself, Eric Heisman, for Brett, uh, we will see you tomorrow. And, Brett? Go Strohs. Let's get you the go. hearts going. <laughs> <laughs> That was great.